Uh, good morning, everybody. How's it going? Uh, we're going to take a little look at Pachman Terrace today, the next uh, encyclical by John the 23rd that is in the textbook right after Mater et Magistra. All right, so let's dig in. I'll try to keep this brief, then we can move on to the homework portion of the program, and I'll put a couple slides and notes up on the teacher ease. All righty, Pete, Pachman in Terrace. An encyclical written by John the Twenty Third, Saint John the Twenty Third, in nineteen sixty three, April of nineteen sixty three. So it's not an anniversary document of Rerum Novarum, which we all know was eighteen ninety one. It was written to address the entire world during the difficult years of the Cold War. Think about the time we're looking at here. This document was written in 1963. We have the Berlin Wall coming up, uh, being built. We have the Cuban Missile Crisis happening. Um, so let's take a little look at the Berlin Wall portion first. The Berlin Wall, if you haven't studied this yet, had gone up in August of 1961. So this is uh, April of 63. We're looking at August of 61, the Berlin, go, Berlin Wall goes up, dividing Berlin into eastern and western sectors, and essentially east and west Germany. The purpose of this wall was, of course, to divide, but the official purpose, as it was stated, was to keep the western fascists from entering east Germany. Uh, but history tells us, and our suspicion of the Soviets, uh, tells us um, at that time the understanding was to be a barrier against um, East Germans defecting to the Free West. So that's one of the major pieces of tension. This is Western Europe. Over by us here, we have um, in the fall of 1962, the United States demanded that the Soviet Union halt construction of nearly, uh, excuse me, of newly discovered missile um, bases in communist Cuba. So this was 1962. This is the Cuban Missile Crisis. So this is going on, that's about what, 90 miles from the U.S. shores. And the Soviets, Soviets did not see why they should halt production in Cuba of these missiles. And the Soviets pledged to protect Cuba in 1960. And of course, what we have here is, since we have a, a communist and then a very close to the interest of the United States, we have a standoff ensuing. So a standoff ensued and the threat of nuclear battle was real, but uh, it was eventually diffused. And there's a really interesting story about the Cuban Missile Crisis and John the 23rd um, and his sort of intervention in um, helping these powers stand down from each other. So he has, as the naval powers faced one another, President Kennedy, who is a Catholic, the only Catholic president so far, sent a message to John the 23rd. The Pope read it and crafted a message and read it on Vatican Radio. So we see President Kennedy reaching out to John the 23rd, perhaps to try to uh, see if he can do something to smooth this over. And here's what the message said that John the 23rd put out on Vatican Radio. We beg all governments not to remain deaf to this cry of humanity, that they do all that is in their power to save peace. They will thus spare the world from the horrors of a war whose terrifying consequences no one can predict. But they continue discussions as this loyal and open behavior has great value as a witness of everyone's conscience and before history, promoting, favoring, accepting conversations at all levels and at any time is a rule of wisdom and prudence which attracts the blessings of heaven and of earth. Well, that's the message that was read by John the 23rd. So this next, the next day, 
this message appeared in newspapers around the world, including, including the Soviet Union. So this message gets out, and as it has been stated, um, this gave uh, Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviets, Khrushchev a way out. The Soviets could look like men of peace if they removed their missiles and ships. And essentially it looked like everyone was giving in together. And two days after John XXIII's message, the Soviets left. So it's an important piece of history and uh, people also recognizing John XXIII's specific power he had. Okay, for the rest of this portion here, I'm going to uh, take a look at the Catholic Encyclopedia um, and its description of Pachamon Terrace. It's the eighth encyclical of John the Twenty-Third, issued April 11th, 1963. Although widely hailed as an encyclical on international peace in the narrow sense, its scope covers the whole range of order in human affairs, for it identifies peace with that unity of order that is based on respect for the law of God. To this end, it expounds in a more comprehensive manner than any previous papal document the order that should prevail between man and man, between man and the community, and between communities inter se and the world community. Because of the immense scope of the encyclical it is not surprising that different interests welcomed it for different reasons. In one respect, it appealed to all, namely, in its sincere desire for brotherhood between men. Western newspapers welcomed the encyclical for its humanitarian vision and boundless confidence in man's capacity for peace. Soviet news agencies gave it the favor of relatively extensive summary. In certain respects, its welcome was selective. Some socialist sources praised it vaguely for positions already advocated by socialists, particularly internationalism, while the communist press headlined its plea for disarmament to the extent that the Vatican Radio felt it was necessary to issue a reminder that insistence on human freedom and dignity rather than advocacy of disarmament was at the core of the document. The first part of the document, of, uh, excuse me, the first part of Pachman Terrace is built on the truth that order between individual men must be founded on the fact that man is a person. Such order consists essentially in respect for rights and duties that pertain to man entirely in virtue of his personality. In its second part, the encyclical presents the relationship between the individual and the state as basically one of subjection to authority, not, however, as an authority rooted simply in physical force, but rather one representing the coercive power of a moral entity. For this reason, the ordinances of human authority must be in accordance with the order of God's law. In the third part of the encyclical, it argues that states, just as individuals, are the subjects of rights and duties. These rights and duties are translated into uh, practical action by the persons who govern the state. For through these alone can the state be subject, subjected to the moral law. The fourth part of the encyclical urges the importance of interdependence between states and countries. Greater today than ever before, the collaboration that such interdependence stimulates puts an end to former ideas about absolute sovereignty and absolute national self-determination. The conclusion of the encyclical is devoted to pastoral exhortations. Catholics are urged to cooperate both individually and corporately with non-Catholics and even non-Christians for the advancement of praiseworthy social political ends. We see John the 23rd quite ahead of his time. But very, uh, it, it's a foundation for the modern documents. That's where we'll stop, folks. See you on the next video.